And I'm going to read this because <laughs> that's about the way I get to. Uh, so David is on the book of that gratitude guide. Uh, accomplished author and storyteller delivering his message of inspiration and hope through his popular books and daily gratitude journal. David Brooke is the author of the book, The Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal, and a contributing author of the Amazon International Bestseller, Ready, Aim, Captivate, Happiness Drops with Gratitude, and Gratitude Nuggets to Chew On at Amazon.com Motivational Speaker. Um, David spoke at my Rotary Club in Mill Creek and was absolutely, absolutely captivating. I was just so impressed. Asked him if he would consider speaking down in Arizona, and when I twisted his arm a bit, he was very happy to join us. And without further ado, I'll get him. Thank you, Maria. I'd also like to publicly thank and acknowledge Steve and Maria Matthews for uh, the accommodations the last couple of days. They've been just phenomenal hosts, and I'm very, very blessed and uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, let me start out by asking everybody a quick question. How many people here, by show of hands, have suffered a significant personal loss in your life? About 90%. I am very fortunate. I speak at schools. I've spoken at prisons. I've done all sorts of service organizations and companies and so on. Regardless of the age, even at schools, it's always about 80 or 90 percent of the people that raise their hands. It's just mind-blowing to me how many people have suffered from some sort of loss. My significant loss happened on September 29th, 1998. It was a Tuesday morning. I woke up about 6.30. I looked over in bed and my wife wasn't there. I thought, that's strange. I wonder where Dana is. My little four-year-old son, Connor, comes in. Where's mommy? I don't know. Let's try to find her. So we walk out. We walk out to the hallway. My 14-year-old son, Kyle, comes in. Same question. I don't know. We don't know where she is. So we walk downstairs. We walk down the hallway and we look downstairs. She's over in front of the washer and dryer on the floor, kind of curled over. It doesn't look good. So we go rushing down there. I turn her over, there's stuff coming out of her mouth, it just, it looked bad. Connor starts crying immediately. I said to Kyle, go call the police, call fire, and within a matter of five or ten minutes, there was probably 25 people in our house. They had her out on the floor and they had these wires and tubes and paddles and all that electronic stuff, you see, shock, most surrealistic thing I'd ever been through in my life. Finally, for those of you, and again, People ask me all the time, do you want a PowerPoint? Do you want one of those things with the clickers and everything? I go, nope. I want to look at every person's eyes in the, in the group. I did the church recently, a couple thousand people. And I like to look at every single person knowing there's stories out there. I'm just the one that's fortunate enough to be telling it up here in my path and how I got to gratitude and what changed my life. So for those of you that have been through something like this, I will tell you one thing. Time loses all measure. And this little short fire person comes up to me and she says, Mr. Brooke, we've been working on your wife for an hour and a half. We still don't have any heartbeat. You want us to continue? Well, even when you're in shock, your brain still manages to produce a little bit of logic. And I thought 90 minutes without a heartbeat. Never before that I had to make a life and death decision for somebody in my life. I thought about it for a few minutes and I said, um, no, you can stop. And she was dead. She was 38 years old, mother of both my sons, wonderful young woman. And I noticed with this whole thing of shock, and I always mention, I mentioned it, I think, to Sherry too, I'm not sure, or George, I forget. But when I get to talk to people afterwards, I'm fascinated by the stories they tell me, how they got through some of the things that they struggled with. But I noticed within a couple of days, I walked upstairs, I walked out on this deck, our house had been teeming with people, friends, family, coming over to help us, bringing food, everything. And I walked out on the deck and I was by myself and I kind of looked up, up at the sky. And I remember pinching myself like this and going, um, I'm just skin and bones, I'm just another human being out here. I don't think I can do this. I don't know, I'm gonna do this. And for the first time in my life, I completely understood why people kill themselves. I had had so many other tragedies happen to me up until that point. I thought, I don't think I can do this. So I sat there and I looked out to that sky for about five minutes and I then I made a decision, I'm not doing that. I'm not gonna kill myself. I got my four-year-old Connor, my 14-year-old Kyle, as I mentioned, I'm not killing myself. 
So now it's off the table, so that's no longer a choice. But as I mentioned, I had had so many other tragedies. My mom had died of cancer. My father, very prominent, really, really powerful attorney in Seattle, had committed suicide. Graduated from high school, two of my best friends were killed the night I graduated in a car accident. It just went on and on and on. And I remember thinking at some point here, I am going to have to figure out how I'm going to cope with this because this is a little overwhelming for me. And one of the things that I realized is that a lot of this depends on how you look at things. This depends. Glass half full, half empty, you've always heard that. So I'd like, you to ask, I'd like to ask you all to do me a favor. Just stand up for a second if you would. It's always good after that meal just to get a bit of a stretch. <laughs> and I'd like you to extend your right hand and I want you to turn it in a clockwise manner. Now there's no clocks here. So if anybody's not certain, here's my watch, you know, because we're in a digital world now, you know, you can't even tell. So clockwise, so keep it going clockwise, get that nice stretch. And then as you're keeping it clockwise, just start bringing it down slowly. Keep it going clockwise, down to your forehead, your eyes, your chin, your chest, and down to your waist. Now what direction is it going? Anybody? Bueller? Counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. Thank you, Katie. Okay, you can sit down. Katie, that's good for a book. Just, just, for, just for yelling that out. I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Washington who would say Tammy said that earlier. I have friends of mine that are much smarter than I am, masters and PhDs that go, I saw you talk the other day. What's the story with this circle thing? What do people do? Do they change midstream? I go, no, you goofball. I said, you look at it from the top and the bottom. It's just my way of saying you have a choice. We have a choice. It's like this T in the road. You can go left or right. But what I realized is I struggled through this. This is before, because Sherry had asked me about how I got to the gratitude piece. But I realized I was going to have to survive. And gratitude was one of the things I found. But before I found gratitude, I realized that, and I mentioned this to Maria this afternoon, is it takes as long as it takes. Everybody's journey is different. I get to know people all the time that I've heard, I hear their stories and, and I think and they look at the person well how come this, how come her, how come, I go don't even worry about them. Every one of these sets of eyes that gets to look at me or I get to look at them especially in that church one of the services is about 1500 people. And I tell them I said this is your journey. It takes as long as it takes. I never use PowerPoint. I don't like it. It's the clicker as I said but occasionally in the church and some of those where they're really big I'll put up a picture of Colonel Sanders, 63 when he start, well now that's my age. And I know you're going, dang, he doesn't look a day over 62. But anyway, it's, but there's Colonel Sanders with his little, that's when he started KFC. So it doesn't matter what the journey is, it's your journey. Even those of you with spouses, and I obviously lost my spouse, but it, it's your journey. It's that person you see in the mirror. And it just takes as long as it takes, and you can't give up. I see this happen all the time. So many people I've been around are suicides. I am fortunate enough most recently, I'm going to be speaking in the army. The suicide rates are off the charts. PTSD, all these different things. People are just calling it a day. And as they always know, suicide is a permanent problem, permanent solution rather to a temporary problem. And I talk about a gratitude journal which I'll get into in a second. But it is so important. Winston Churchill, never, ever, ever give up. But Disney, Stallone, all these people, two, three, four hundred banks to get their financing. They never gave up. And they finally got it. And so I thought in my life, I was going to be a speaker when I was 19 years old. I had no idea what I was going to talk about. I was going to be a motivational speaker. And it wasn't until these, these things that happened to me, these tragedies, when I started saying, I've got to figure out some way to keep myself vertical so I can raise these two little boys but I remember thinking, I can't give up. But at the same time, it's also how you look at things. And in this brain of ours, we put so much crap in it that when I do my workshops, I talk about embrace gratitude. It takes as long as it takes, never give up. And then make room for gratitude. Think about just this when you go out to your cars tonight. You go out and get in those cars. Here's the windshield. It's about two feet by about five feet. Now, look at the size of the rearview mirror. It's about like this. Now, I'm going to do the calculation on this, but I'm guessing it's about 100 to 1. 
or something like that. Now, don't really look at the rear view mirror much. If you see some flashing blue lights, you, know, you can pull over. Understand that, but mostly it's what's in front of you. That is looking forward. I think the good Lord put your eyes in the front of your head for that reason. It's funny when I do the workshops, I do some fun little exercises, and one of them is, is clearing stuff out. And <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have enough time tonight. But I'm amazed how many people drive over junk in their life. They take it from behind them, put it in front of them, and drive over it again. And I'll tell you, the number one subject is ex-spouses. Well, if it just wasn't for, if it wasn't for fill in the blank, my life would be, and I go, stop talking about that. You've already driven over that junk. They go, yeah, you got that term right, junk. And I go, okay, let's not get into personal stuff. But when it comes to not giving up, I thought about that. And when I made that decision not to give up anymore, I noticed I was going to have to be the best dad possible. How many people here are parents? Once again, oh my God, it was 100%. Connor struggled mightily. When he was in, he was four when Dana died. So at four and a half, they tell me in the little preschool, your son is messed up. Exact words. And I said, well, you know, he just lost his mother six months ago. Yeah, whatever. That was her, that was her comment. He's messed up. So they put him through all these little tests and they were bouncing balls and having him jump up and down. And they gave me this big full assessment. In the end, they said, have Connor sit over there. And they sat me down. And they said, here's the problem with Connor. Bop, bop, bop. And they went through all this stuff. And I said, I said, he, he'll do fine. They go, I said, his mother just died six months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's going to have a tough time in life. In fact, you know what? He may not make it in life. He might make it in life. And I said, well, I want him to play sports. Oh, he won't make it in sports. And we live by a school called Roosevelt High School. And I said, you know, he's going to be the quarterback at Roosevelt High School someday. And she goes, <laughs> yeah, no. And she laughed. He's four and a half years old. I walk out to the car, I get in the car, and I just burst into tears. I can't stop crying for about a half hour. So upsetting. Daddy, what's wrong? Nothing, Connor. Don't worry about it. It's okay. But Connor would not give up. He kept trying in school. I had to hold him back in first grade. But I think he and Kyle both got something from me about we're not going to give up and we're not going to let this, this loss of Dana define our lives. And he kept trying. But when he played baseball, he didn't get it. So when you go out there, again, those of you that are parents, the majority of you here, tee ball. Okay, now the ball doesn't, it just sits on a tee. It doesn't even move. How hard is it to hit a ball on a tee? Connor couldn't hit it. Now I know we're right across the street for the Mariners. They can't always hit either, but. Um, <laughs> sorry, I am from Seattle. And so, but he would swing up here and he would miss it. I go, Connor, lower your bat. And so finally he'd lower, lower. And he couldn't hit the ball, and it was just so frustrating. Finally, he hits the tee, the tee, not the ball. The ball dribbles forward. He goes, Dad, I got a hit. And I go, Connor, it's not quite how it works. But he kept trying. He refused to give up. He went through all those levels, and he never played. Couldn't hit, couldn't run, couldn't catch, couldn't throw. Other than that, he was okay. <laughs> But we got to May 31st, 2005. He was about uh, 11 years old. Still playing, never playing, he was on the team. And we get to this game, and it's the bottom of the seven, and it's seven to six, the other team. There's two guys out, and there's a guy in second and third. And I think the coach was out of players, frankly. So there's nobody else to call. So I, guess who I see coming out of the dugout? And he starts walking to the plate. Now most kids never acknowledge their parents. No, oh, not Connor. Dad, I'm up. He's like waving to me in the stands. I'm going, Connor, you're not, I'm not even supposed to, you're not supposed to pretend I'm here. Doesn't matter. I'm up. So he gets up and strike one, ball one, strike two, ball two. Full count. Next pitch comes in. He just rips it down the third baseline. Goes just inside the bag, in the left field. The guy from third comes in. Guy from second round, third comes in. The ball, the catcher, the guy, they all crash at the home plate. The ball pops out. They win the game eight to seven. He is sitting out on second base. Dad, I got a hit. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the stands, and I know you parents can relate to this. I've got a lump in my throat the size of a softball. The entire team uh, still gets me. Runs out to second base, puts him on their shoulders, and carries him off the field. 
And I couldn't talk for about an hour and a half, maybe longer. But when we got home that night, I sat him down and I sat down on the bed and had him sit right next to me and I said, Connor, it was never about baseball. I said, you never ever gave up. And he never gave up, neither did Kyle, neither did I. And Connor ended up being a 3.4 student. And the senior year at Bothell High School, I was telling Tammy about she lived out in Everett. He was the leading hitter on the baseball team his senior year. And as a matter of fact, sometimes I'll, I'll, if I use a screen occasionally, but Connor is now six foot two, going to San Diego in college. I'm going to head down there for a couple of talks tomorrow, and I'm going to see him. And playing sports and getting a 3-5 in school. And this was a kid who was told he couldn't do it. And he couldn't, uh, he wasn't going to make it in life. And when I tell people about not giving up, well, that's super, Dave. But what are some of the other things you can do? Well, one of the things that happened to me when I talked about embracing gratitude, it takes as long as it takes. It's your journey. Don't ever give up. Make room for gratitude. Get that junk out of your brain. A buddy of mine says to me, you need to get a gratitude journal. My fraternity brothers, five and six years after Dana died, said, you know, you're still not right. And part of the reason is, it's not only did I lose Dana, she was addicted to prescription medication. That junk that's out there, Oxycontin and Vicodin and that kind of stuff. I lost her, we lost my business I had, we lost our house, we lost our savings, we lost everything. We had to move in with some friends. I didn't like to get into that because it was a long time ago now, but it shows what you can bounce back from. How many people here have ever heard of a gratitude journal? Okay, again, a few. How many have ever heard of a journal? How many have ever seen a journal? <laughs> okay, thanks. So this buddy of mine says to me, you should get, I said, what's a gratitude journal? It's what you're writing every day, what you're grateful for. So I went on Amazon and I got a gratitude journal. And I did what a lot of people do and I just set it on the shelf and didn't touch it for two or three months. And then I started writing in it every day. I started noticing this amazing thing happening to me because I was reframing and refocusing everything in my life that I was grateful for and had as opposed to not grateful for or didn't have. Eventually, I did my own, the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. And even though I'm a member of Seattle Four Rotary and a longtime Rotarian and so understand service above self, I tell people, I sell the journals and I sell some other books I've done, but I don't care if you buy mine. You get a spiral notebook, but you will not believe the power of taking six to seven minutes a day to write in a journal and what it'll do for you. I'd like to just quickly give you an example. This journal, it's set up on the left-hand side. It says day and date and it says daily number, which I'll come back to in a second. This is what you're grateful for today. This is the highlight of your day, just a sentence or two. And then the right-hand side is what you're going to be grateful for. It's called your gratitude intentions. Your prefrontal cortex cannot tell the difference between what you think is going to happen and what's actually happened. So you can program it to be grateful ahead of time. So on daily number, what that is, is that's a number of, that you assign to yourself every day from 1 to 10. 10 is the best day of your life and 1 is one of the worst days of your life. It gives you a way to anchor it. And when you write in there, you can go back and reference that. So what I'd like to do, just for a second, I want you to think about what your number would be right now. Again, 10, one of the best days of your life, one, one of the worst. Just pick a number that you assign. This is not your friend or spouse, it's just you. I want you to think about what that number is. Just kind of plan it right in your head. So I want to now poll the audience, if I may. So if you're a one to a five, I don't want you to raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But how many people here are sixes? Okay, couple, three. Sevens, a few more, about the same. Eights, okay. Nines, one. Tens, okay. So here's what I'd like to do. Just kind of pay attention to those numbers. I usually do this on a sheet of paper and we can follow a little more carefully, but again, I've just got 20, 25 minutes tonight, so I do a little more condensed version. So here's the first thing I want you to do. This again is back to personally, just you. Every so often I'll be doing, somebody looks at their spouse. Don't be looking at them. This is just you. So I want you to think about the number one thing you're most grateful for in your life. I used to give people tips, because I know what it is for me. I know what one, two, three, I know I'm all the way down the line. But I want you to think, what's the number one thing you're most grateful for? Okay? Now, once that's in your brain, 
I want you to think of the second thing you're most grateful for. You've got number one and you got number two. You don't have to tell anybody, this is just for you. If you're writing them down, you could write them down. And then the last thing, this is about six o'clock or so today. I want, to think, I want you to think, what was your highlight of your day yesterday? Because I put this in here every day. What was the best thing that happened to you yesterday? Now I will give you a hint on that one. My 19 year old son, Connor, who's six foot two, still slips and calls me daddy once or twice a week. And that is the highlight of my day. Thank you, daddy. When are you coming to San Diego? Say hi to Steve and Maria for me. That's always the highlight of my day because that's my little baby boy who still says that. Okay, so you got the number one thing you're grateful for, the number two thing you're grateful for, and the highlight of your day yesterday. Okay, now I'd like you to think, rethink that number. We'll see if it changes at all. So, again, one to five, don't raise your hand. Sixes. Okay, there's no sixes. My work is done. Thank you so much. It's been a great... Sevens. Okay, a couple. Eights. A few more. Nines. A few more. And tens. No tens. Okay, well, I almost got you. I got a few more there. When you write it down, there's something visceral about writing it down. When I have a sheet of paper, and again, I don't have as much time today, but when you write down, I am so grateful to Steve and Maria Matthews for inviting me into their home. I'm so grateful for Katie letting me speak at the Rotary. I'm so grateful for the, grateful for the opportunity to talk to Tammy. Any of those things, it's a visceral thing. It starts in your CPU up here. It goes into your heart, your arm, your hand, your pen, and it goes on to the paper. There's something magical. It's the same reason why we take notes. Of course, when I do schools. Question over here. Yeah, do you have an app? Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, I do have an app. And it's just, it's, you know, we're talking about Steve's app that opens that garage door. Yeah. And it's like, and you just go, you press on the Brooker's Daily Gratitude Journal. I'm so grateful to uh, George for having a conversation with him when I came in. You press it and then it just prints it. But it's not the same. It's not the same. There's something about it. You can go back. This is my actual journal. It takes five to six minutes a day is all it takes. And I go back and I look about what was happening on that day. So you can imagine uh, last Sunday what the highlight of my day was when the Seattle uh, Seahawks uh, won the Super Bowl after 39 years of nothing. Anyway, but it reframes it and it makes such a difference. But I will tell you the difference that writing in a gratitude journal can make. My mother was manic depressive. Yeah, back then, or I guess it was called that, now it's bipolar. She died of cancer, as I mentioned earlier. But when I was going to school, she, she did something to me that was so rude and so cruel. And she would call me, I was going to the University of Washington, and she'd sit these pills by the phone. These are all my sleeping pills. I'm gonna take all these unless you come over and see me right now. And I would go, Mr. Gallup, I need to leave. My mom is sick. I wouldn't tell him why, but she had this big depression problem. So I felt that maybe I got a little bit of that from her. I mean, like, maybe I got a little bit of the manic thing. I don't think so, but my friends disagree. <coughs> but I noticed one day I woke up here about a year ago. I started doing a lot of speaking. And I was a two. And it's not something you share with people. There's a whole stigma attached to this. So what do I say? If you're a one to a five, don't even raise your hand. Because everybody, everybody struggles in a different way, but there's ways around it. There's tools in the toolkit, and that gratitude journal is one of them. So I knew I was in deep trouble. So I went down to Starbucks. I took my journal, and I wrote. It took me the five or six minutes, had a little latte, and I noticed then I was about a four or five. Felt a little bit better. My number one thing by far is my health. I've lost so many people. I could, I could name 25 names that have died on me. Family and friends, and I mentioned just a few of them, but tons of people. Artificial hips, valves, elbows, knees. It's just, I'm grateful for my health. And then it goes down with my boys and so on and so forth. But it helped a little bit, but then I had a talk that day. It was a chamber of commerce up in Burlington, north of Seattle. It's a pretty sized group, 200 people. So when I'm done talking, this gal comes up to me and she stands, she's just crying. The tears are coming down. I get, actually, later, I've gotten a lot of emotional people tell me their stories. She goes, you just changed my life. Her name was Janice. And I said, well, thank you. I said, I don't know if I changed your life. Maybe I've given you some tools or inspiration. What was it that I said? I can't tell you. It's one of your stories. It was too close to home for me. 
but can I give you another hug? And then she ended up buying a journal and some things. So there's a bunch of people and they're standing in line and it's, it's really exciting. And when you write a book, people want you to sign it and stuff. It's really, really cool. In fact, I have a, when we do the drawing, I want to do it with the tickets. Are you guys going to do another drawing with the tickets or are you guys done with that? What's that? We do it every week. But are you going to do another one tonight? No. Dang. So we could. Well, we, we should. Well, keep your tickets. We'll do another one because I want to tell you, okay. when you write a book, it's really exciting when people wait in line and they want to do it. And so I always give one away, and I'm very sensitive to time. I've only got about five more minutes. And so they always, you know, pick the number, and then they go, Katie. And they all clap and stuff, you know, and the person. So this happened to be another rotary, and I give the person the book, and I go, here you go, congratulations, everybody's cheering, and then she walks back to her seat, and I said, hey, by the way, if you'd like, in a few minutes, I'll sign that for you. She looks back at me, and she goes, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think she was looking for John Grisham or somebody. But it, it, does, it does make such a difference, and I noticed that I went to get in my car after changing that young woman's life and watching how many lives I get to impact every single week by these speaking gigs that I do and I got in my car in Burlington and I'll tell you if you ever wonder who your best friend is, is, is in this world who's the first person you call if you get really good or really bad news I think it's a pretty good indicator who your best friend is so I was gonna call Connor first I was gonna call Kyle second I just changed somebody's life but I chose not to I was running a, a Lowe's home improvement at the time big store up there <laughs> And I did something that's kind of embarrassing, but I don't care. I took the rear view mirror and I looked at myself and I went, I'm so freaking proud of you. <laughs> You're impacting some lives as opposed to, uh, where's the lumber? Uh, where do I find the hammers and nails? I don't know, I'm the store manager. I don't know that stuff. But I had this big smile on my face and I'm driving back to Seattle. I realize I'm a nine now. I'd gone from a two to a four or five to a nine. Didn't take a drink, didn't do drugs, didn't smoke dope, all this crazy, didn't take a pill. Prescription pills now are killing more people than booze and heroin and this stuff combined. It's just ridiculous. So I'm going to wrap up and I'm tell you a couple last things here. I just would ask you to consider a gratitude journal. Again, if you get mine, that's fine. But it doesn't matter. But you cannot believe what it does when you write down everything in your life that you have versus what you don't have. This craziness that he's got that boat, this house, this, it's just ridiculous. We don't realize how much we have. I have a little sign-up sheet on the corner table here. I do a video every single day on YouTube. Two-minute gratitude video. Then I send a featured one out every Monday. People say to me all the time, how do you come up with a new idea every day? Seriously? Like, you don't think, I mean, one day I did one on my furnace. Now, where I'm from, when I left the day before yesterday, I was 14. I'm just gra grateful for my furnace just chugging away, keeping us at about 70. It's just like the heat pumps down here working hard. There's so many things to be grateful for. We get all caught up in this stuff. I don't have this and he has that and so forth. Well, this will focus you every single day on what you have as opposed to what you don't have. It makes such a big difference. Last thing I would offer when you learn to embrace gratitude and all the power that has and you get to change lives. That's one of the reasons I'm such a huge fan. I get to speak to a lot of rotary service above self. If you want to help yourself, help others. And this is a huge way to do that. You've got to keep this foundation strong if you're going to be building high rises. Remember, it takes as long as it takes. Don't ever give up. Clear out your brain. Get rid of that junk. Make room for gratitude. Get a gratitude journal. And the last thing is sharing gratitude. Everything is so much more valuable when you share it. I never did drugs. I never did dope. I went to the University of Washington, LSD, and that, that stuff, it's all crud. I never did it. But I did, well, it's kind of an adrenaline junkie. So I skydive and scuba dive, I race hydroplanes, and I've been a pilot for a long time, did all these crazy things. And I decided to go skydiving once. So seven of my buddies want to go skydiving with me. So I make reservations for eight. And then that week there was seven, and then by Wednesday it was six, and then Thursday it was five, and then on Friday, our scheduled reservations on Saturday and Friday get a couple of calls. Dave, uh, <coughs> I, I got a sore throat. I don't think I can make it tomorrow. So I walk up to Issaquah skydiving proudly at the counter. Hi, Brooke, party of eight. 
goes, where are all your friends? I go, I don't have any. <laughs> I went by myself. And occasionally in the church, I have a picture of me jumping out there with a static line. You know, I later did the free fall thing. But I never got to share that with anybody. I'm the only guy that knew what that was like to step off that plane at 2,800 feet, whatever it is, 3,000 feet, something like that. So you have to share. It becomes so much more valuable when you get to share it. So please consider this. When I do radio, they say, what, are the, what do we want the audience to know if they hear nothing else? Just consider a gratitude journal. And consider the power of embracing gratitude. Don't give up. Make room for gratitude. Try a gratitude journal and share gratitude. My feeling is it changes lives. It transforms lives. And in my case, I truly, truly, truly believed it saved my life. And it can save you guys' too. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. One of the things that our club does um, for our speakers is we donate a book in your name to oh, the perfect. Alta Loma Library. So this oh, look will be at going that. into their library. Thank this you. one is Buzz Boy and Fly Guy. Oh, how, how appropriate. <laughs> Katie, did you so, know that ahead of time? I didn't pick, Ken picked out the book. So, but yes, thank oh, you cool. very much. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much.